Today's parasha Shoftim, which is Judges. And in the parasha, God appoints judges, police officers, protectors, guardians of the word. Guardians of what God's commandments are for us to follow. Do you remember there's a lot going on over the past few weeks with the children of Israel? They're you know, they've come out of Galut, and they're anticipating the entering of Geulah. Geulah means redemption. Galut means exile. So they've been exiled for many, many years from what God's redemption is, and now he's bringing them into Geulah. Every one of us in the, in the faith are looking for Geulah. In fact, that's what we should be crying out for. We should be crying out for redemption. Now is the time to do so. The month of Elul, which is this month, um, typically every day a Jewish person will read the book of Psalms 27. Um, and they're preparing their hearts and their minds for Geula, for redemption, which comes at Rosh Hashanah. This month is a very, very good month for us. It's a very solid month. It's a very, it's a month of introspection. It's a month of looking at your own self. It's a month of uh, determining where you've been with God, where you've been with His commandments, and what you as a person have done in the world for the last year uh, to bring about His word to those who are lost. And so God is moving mightily in most people at this time and in this month uh, to prepare their hearts and their minds for Rosh Hashanah and for that great redemption which we all anticipate. I have to say that every Shabbat should, should be one of joy but also one of sadness because the Mashiach hasn't returned yet. So every Shabbat we anticipate the Geulah. We anticipate the redemption of the Messiah. We anticipate His return and His coming. And we think about Him, Yeshua, as the Messiah, what He's done. He's the, he's the one truth that exists for all man to believe in. Yeshua is the one truth that exists for, throughout all the world. Each and every one of us walk day, our days out. We walk our days half in truth, half in falsehood. Materialism around about us, all these things that we have, all the things that we're fighting for, all, you know, we're working hard to do, uh, to, 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 you know, take ourselves to the next level. When you're at work, you're thinking to yourself, is my boss going to recognize me? Is, is the person next to me going to realize who I am and how I can help them? Or is the person next to me at Shabbat, uh, do they understand that I'm a loving, caring person and that I have uh, a heart and that, you know, that I can help them? Or does my best friend uh, think that I'm, you know, a jerk because of how I reacted? Or is my wife or my husband? All these things that we think about all day, day uh, they're important to us. But the most important thing is the Mashiach. The most important thing is to get our lives right. The most important thing is to anticipate Geulah, understanding that you, at this very moment, are in Galut. You're at this very moment in exile. You're not in redemption. You're not in freedom. And regardless of whether or not the children of Israel who live in Israel, those Bnei Israel who are actually physically in Eretz Israel, regardless of the fact those people live there, that means nothing. Yeshua said that you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Remember that? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what does it mean for us, as the children of Israel, to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai? Each one of you are saying it. You're saying, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. You're saying, Blessed are you, Lord Yeshua, who comes in the name of the Lord. How good are the feet of those who bring the good news. As he came lowly riding on a donkey, we we praise and give Him glory. Each one of us, the Christians in the world, say, Baruch Adonai. They believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but He's not here. Why? 
a people, a, a nation has to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. All Israel has to say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. We're not there. We're in Galut. We're in exile. So it's not redeemed us yet. The Messiah must come to redeem you. So how do we, how do you or I really come to understand the the love and the mercy of God toward his people and ultimately feel the comfort of his presence to carry us along this journey in exile in Galut. Because I was listening to a song this week, it says that uh, pictures on the wall, they fade away. Um, a couple weeks back I talked about having certificates and things like that that we, 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 we strive for. We strive for success, we strive for things that people recognize, right? That's a human nature thing. If you don't do it, it's just kind of odd, you know. I mean, most people that are, are working individuals that are in the world, when you walk down the street and you see someone that has nothing, that's, that's, that's homeless, you think to yourself, well, what would turn that person? Why could they not have had the ambition to, to, to become something? A lot of times it's uh, mental illness or it's something like that, but then sometimes you'll run into someone that seems perfectly fine. And you'll think to yourself, what on earth happened to you that, that you're homeless, that you couldn't have just gone and worked and, and worked hard like a normal like a normal person and just at least taking care of yourself right but that's the materialistic world and and what we say is pictures on the walls they fade away the stuff that we have it fades away but what will not fade away is our the spark the eternal spark of Mashiach that lives inside of us our bodies our flesh our spirits are eternal they last forever So building your treasures in heaven or building your treasures on earth, where do we want to build them? That's the question. Where do we want to have treasure? You can have both, by the way. But your focus can't be the earth. The focus must be heaven. And building your treasure for eternity and with God. Because he's coming back for that redemption. And when you stand in front of him, when you stand in front of the Messiah, I mean, I think about it, I've been thinking a lot about standing in front of him. And what will he say? I mean, a lot of us look in the mirror and we see ourselves through our eyes, but what do others see? And maybe Yeshua sees what others see and not what you see. I can look in the mirror and I see, well, I'm this and I'm that and I'm this and I'm that. And then you talk to somebody and they're like, you're nothing like that. Do you not know yourself? I remember uh, I ran into some old friends from elementary school. And we went out, and, and uh, we were kind of having a small little reunion. And it was a funny thing. I won't tell the story, but it was a hilarious story about me. And uh, one of the individuals looked at me, and I said, I would never have done that. I said that. I go, I would never have done that. That's nothing like me. And literally, like, five people were taught, looked at me and go, do you not know yourself? And, and I thought, well... What do I not see that the world sees, you know? What do you not see that Yeshua sees about you? The, the reality is, is that the humility that must exist when we stand in front of God is greater than looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, you're this, you're that. There's a lot of that going on in the church today where the church looks at you and says, well, you have to look at yourself. Be your best self. A few, a few years back, uh, you know, that book that came out, Your Best Life Now, all these things that, that people are looking for self-help to, to, to become better. And, you know, they talk themselves up. They hype themselves up in the mirror. And I do it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a total uh, guilty individual. I look in the mirror and say, you're, a, you're the man. You're, you're going to kill it. You're crushing it. Look at you. You're awesome, you know. If you keep doing that, the humility that must exist goes away. You do begin to feel like you're something. And our lives have to be submitted to God's will. Our lives have to be submitted to God's kingdom. The moment I look at myself and say, you can do this, you're going to have that, you're going to go out and get this, is the moment I'm not giving God's will 100% of my life. Rather than looking in the mirror and saying, Lord, what you will for this vessel, I will do. I'm simply a vessel filled with the spark of Mashiach. 
to bring light to the world. The humility that's required to do that is not taught in the world. It's not taught in your family or in your home. I teach my children all the time. You know, you're a Humphrey. You, you know who you are. You're strong. We're not weak. Is that the right thing to do? Yeah, it's the right thing because kids have to, kids have to grow up with confidence, right? And they have to build confidence to be able to, to live in the world. But at the same time, they have to understand, I should be teaching them now, you're a vessel which houses the Spirit of God. The nephesh which is inside of you belongs to God. So you as a vessel must do what God wills. And you have to understand what it means to do what God's will as a royal priesthood. If you remember the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood had no land. They had no allotment of a, of a fortune. Why? Because they were made to do the will of God. The Levitical priesthood has been replaced with this royal priesthood, which you are all a part. Those of you who have come into the spark of Mashiach, to the light of the Messiah, the idea, the concept, what we have to attempt to do as believers is to reach the state of Yechida. Yechida is the singularity with God, oneness with God. We have to become one with God in life. So what does it mean to become one with God? How do you become one with Him? One flesh. We're going to have a wedding today. Echad basar is the, is the term for one flesh. Basar literally is meat. Okay? One flesh. One meat. And in the, in the wedding ceremony, we, we, we talk about a man shall leave his father and his mother, and a woman shall leave, and they shall come together, and they shall become as one flesh. Okay? They have to become as one. You also are becoming one with God. You're marrying God becoming one flesh with God that concept is hard to understand because it's now becoming one flesh you are in the flesh with a spirit because God is spirit a lot of us like to apply anthropomorphic uh, attributes to God we like to believe that God has has arms and legs and feet and hands and fingers Yeshua came in the flesh but God himself is a spirit the spirit which resides inside of us finds a state of Yechida with God where we become one with Him. So we have to fight to become one with God. We have to work hard to become one with God. This is what Paul says, the tearing away of the flesh and the spirit. Literally, what Yeshua came, did as Mashiach ben Yosef, I heard, I heard someone say this, what he did as Mashiach ben Yosef is he only came to separate the soul from the spirit, from the flesh. That's the first thing he had to do. In order to take us to a place of Geulah, a place of redemption, in order to bring the people of Israel back, he had to first separate the soul from the flesh. He did that through his death and resurrection and the sending of the Ruach HaKodesh for our salvation. So now that soul that separates from your flesh has to find God. It has to meet with God. It has to become one with God so that it can direct the vessel, which is the flesh, to do what God requires of you. The humility required to understand God in this journey is pretty intense. And we have to do a lot of soul searching. We have to do a lot of vetting to understand what that means. We have to read the word a lot to understand what God is doing and how he's working in us and how he's working in the world and what he wants to do in the world so that when his redemption truly comes, the day of his redemption, when it truly comes, that we'll understand it. These are the things that you're supposed to be pondering in the month of Elul. Prior to Rosh Hashanah, preparing for the redemption for the Geulah. Why has man been tossed between Galut and Geulah? Why are we tossed between the two? Because we are. I'm going to give, a, I'm gonna give a, an analogy 
that I want to use for what we as human beings deal with in the flesh and in the spirit. But the human reaction to God's commands and statutes, for whatever reason, is to vacillate to and fro between exile and redemption. And my analogy is that, think of a man lying on a beach. And when I was in Florida with my family, they all went up to the rooms. And I'm sitting there under our tent uh, in, a, in a low beach chair. And the tide was far out. Okay, it was, it was low tide. So picture a man lying on the beach and the tides are very, very low and the water is far from him and he's comfortable on the sand of the shore. He's very comfortable. I was very comfortable sitting in my chair. In fact, it was so comfortable, I fell asleep. And then I picked up my phone. I hear a text message. I pick up my phone and I'm on the beach and I'm looking at my phone. I'm not looking anywhere around me. I'm just looking at my phone. But I was in a good spot. The cars, the cars were driving in front of me, okay? So there was a, a driving lane on the beach, and the cars were driving in front, and then there was a, a lot of beach after the cars were driving and then the ocean. But I became too comfortable, and I failed to watch that the tide was rising. With certainty, the tide encompassed me, sweeping me into the not even realizing that the tide was rising, not even realizing that the cars had stopped driving because the tide became, came up so quickly. And I'm telling you, it was a matter of minutes. The tide came up the beach, through the driving lane, into where our tents were, right around my feet. I'm looking at my phone and then all of a sudden, here comes the water. And I thought to myself, what on earth, how in the world did it come so high? How could it, I mean, why didn't I see that? You didn't hear anyone next to me saying, hey, you better get up, dude. You know, no one, they just ignored me. They didn't care. They didn't care that my stuff got wet. They didn't care that, they just, they actually probably laughed. They said, well, look at this guy. He's going to get all soaking wet. So here, I'm going to transition from me to, to a, a, an idea so these rising tides, with certainty, they encompass him, sweeping him into the deep, pulled by the tides into a world he's not in control of, out of safety of the beach. You're not in control of the world out there. You are in control on the beach. You can stand on your own two feet. You can walk to and fro. You get into the ocean. You lose control. He has to fight hard to return to the beach. He swims frantically against the tides, pushing to achieve safety once again on the shore. Imagine he's out there. He gets pulled out, right? The tide comes up. At first, you think to yourself, oh, it's okay. It's just a little bit of tide. But what if that ocean takes you out? One would assume that once the man achieved safety and arrived again at the shore, that he'd not forget his experience and ensure that he watches vigilantly for the tides. However, he does not and can be swept up again. As Shlomo aptly states in Sefer Mishle, Proverbs, as a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool return to his folly. No matter what we do, we'll sit on the beach, the tides will sweep us up. The moment we get back to the beach and sit down, we forget that that even happened. We sit right back down where we were if the tides go back and we don't think well l listen we better watch the tide at two o'clock because at two o'clock the tide's going to come up high remember watch your watch the book of Breshit begins with a story of creation and God's banishment of humankind from his planet from his presence because man was swept up by the tides of sin he was swept up by the tides of sin and again, prior to Adam, the first man, sinning, it was just a beautiful ocean in front of him. Prior to him swimming in that river of sin, it was just a beautiful tree that was good to eat, pleasant to the eye. 
here he is, banished now from God. He follows with God's search. Hold on. The banishment follows with God's search for one man that would foster the divine spark of God. What does it mean to have a divine spark? I say that all the time. Because it's believed that you have a spark right, of Mashiach, a spark of the light. When God said, I must leave, but I will send to you a comforter. The church would recognize that as what paraclete, right, Stephen? The paraclete. I don't know if you, those of you that are in the church, you hear, you heard that term before. He'll send to you a comforter, someone who will, someone who will rest inside of you. That will create a spark inside of you. That will help you realize right from wrong. Because prior to that, the spirit fell on man. Now the spirit lives in man. It's a difference. Falling and living are two different things. Have you ever had a moment where somebody comes up to you out of the blue and random and they say something to you and then all of a sudden you feel this immense presence inside which brings you to reflect upon God. It brings you to begin the reflection on Him and you say, well God is here. This must be a divine appointment that people in the church would say. This is a divine appointment from God. Okay? That same concept idea is what the spark of the Mashiach is inside of you. It lies inside of you. It exists inside of you. And one that, that would swim against the tides of sin and ignite the passion within others around him is supposed to bring back the statutes and commands of God if that divine spark lives inside of you. That's the purpose of that divine spark. To give you that passion to ignite the flame of everyone else around you, the pilot light, to follow the commands and statutes of God. Yeshua said to his disciples, go out into the nations and minister what? The gospel of the kingdom. <clears throat> Preaching to them everything that I have taught you. What does it mean to have preached everything he's taught? Did he teach anything that was not a command or statute of God? Did Yeshua teach anything that was separate from the commands and the statutes of God? Never. In fact, everything he taught was a command and statute of God. In fact, he was the command and statute of God in the flesh. John 1.1. 1, 1. I'll say it again. I said it a few weeks ago. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Yeshua is this Word. We say it every week to get it in your spirit, to get it in your mind, that Yeshua is the word that was, that is, and that forever will be. He is what? Asher, Haya, Vehove, Veyavo, Vehove, and present, and now. Vehaya, he was. Veyavo, he's coming. He is, He was, He's coming. Yeshua is, was, and is coming again. He's the commandments. And by no means would Yeshua tell you or anyone else not to keep the commands. In fact, His commands were even more stringent than the commands that were written in the Torah. In fact, He took the commands to a whole new level. You can't even think upon sin. If you murder in your heart, you've murdered. If you commit adultery in your mind, you've committed adultery. These things are completely different than what than it was before. It was so much easier to live just as a Jewish a Jewish follower. It was easier, why? Right? Because I could hate you for everything. I could hate you as long as I don't kill you. I could spit, curse, no problem. I'm not breaking the commandments. I'm keeping my physical body at bay. The moment I say, God curse you, the moment, the moment I say that, I, I've immediately killed you. It's the same. It's the same effect. Yeshua changes the impact and intensity of the law. 
and of the command. He actually is touching the nefesh which lives inside of you. And this is what Paul states, that it's out of the overflow of a man's heart that he speaks. It's from within you that who is who you are. So it's not the vessel that we reside in. What you see in front of you is a vessel. What, what you don't see, which lies inside of me, is who I am. It's who God made. It's who God took in my mother's womb and blew life into. What's inside of you, what your heart that's beating inside of you, the nephesh that's beating inside of you, that's the life, the spark that God wants to change. That's who God needs. That has to change before your vessel can be used properly. People always say, well, I have to go do this, and the work of my hands is that, and the work of my hands are this, and I go and do that, and I go and I volunteer here, and I go and volunteer there, and I you know, pour myself off pour myself out over here and I pour myself out over there. Is that what God wants of you? You have to be humble first and say, God, what is it that you want? Well, I know that God has made me for ministry because God told me that I was to do this and that. Did God tell you that? Well, yes, a, a, a pastor back, you know, many years ago told me this is what God made of me. This is how God, this is what God meant for me. Well, how does that pastor know and that you don't already know? It's my belief that God will tell you. And if somebody comes to you and tells you, you know what, I feel like you're so, you know, you're, you're this kind of person. All they're doing is confirming what God already told you. They're just going to confirm to you what God told you. You're such a giving person. Well, that's your gift. That becomes a gift. Well, then that's what God did for you. That's what he gave you. And you're giving. But guess what? You'll be giving without even knowing that you're giving. Because that's who God made you to be. Many times we try to do the opposite. We try to be someone that we're, we're not meant to be. And we think to ourselves, well, why am, I, why am I out of sorts, God? Why is my world not feeling right? Because you're not living inside of the lane that God has made you to be. So that he can use you as a vessel. The relationship between God and man throughout history has been forged out of the spiritual battle that humankind faces when confronted with the commands of God. We innately move away from God. We want to move away from His commands because they place boundaries on us that we do not understand protect us from the ripping tides of sin. Those commands place boundaries on us and protect us from the tides of sin. But we want to fight them. We don't argue with him. We want to say, God, you know, we, we don't need to do that. We don't want to do that. And we justify ourselves out of God's Torah. Because now we have this concept called grace. God understands that I'm a wicked man. God understands that I'm an unrighteous person. He understands that I'm made of the flesh. You have to have peace of mind with God. David, it takes years, I think. You know, Solomon Shlomo died at the age of 52 years old. Everyone, no one realizes that he was very young when he died. But he was the king from the time he was 12. He was a young, young king. And this is why he asked the question. God asked him the question, what can I give to you? You would ask anything what can I give you he's a 12 year old boy he doesn't know what he's doing he doesn't know how to lead but imagine a 12 year old boy he looks up to God he says God give me wisdom that I might lead your people give me the words of my mouth that I could lead your people his dad is dead David King David huge shoes Okay, these aren't small shoes. These are huge shoes. We're talking about the Mashiach himself is stated to be David, like David. Mashiach ben David, the son of David. From the loins of David. Huge shoes. Shlomo. Give me wisdom. So God says, I won't only give you wisdom, I'm going to give you everything. 
Because you asked me for understanding, I'm going to give you everything, unlike anyone ever in the world. Unfortunately, Shlomo dies young, but through his hardship of life, because he had many hardships, many of us know that, his 700 wives, 300 concubines, you know, the guy was full of hardships. That would create a lot of hardships. I got one. It's difficult. Just flat plan. But think about it. He's full of hardships. He made really bad choices. He made really bad decisions. He brought in the, the gods of... Uh, of uh, he brought in Ashtaroth. And he brought in all these other, other gods that, that were from his wives. And he put up idols to them in the land of Israel. And he did things that were terrible. And, you know, he confused his life. But he, he didn't, by the time he ended his days, he says, before the silver cord is loosed, meaning that you're getting old, you're aging, you must understand the duty of man. The whole duty of man. And what does it really mean? What's the most important thing? Because all of this is meaningless. Even Shlomo understood that this physical body must have been torn away from the spirit. Even Shlomo understood that your spirit has to lead your physical vessel. Because he said it's all meaningless. The materialism, the, the fight, the build, the, 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 the honor, the pomp, the circumstance, everything that we look to and aim for, all that we try is meaningless unless we keep the commands of God. Shlomo himself is saying this. The wisest man with the most understanding gives us this instruction. The commands, they, they, they protect us from the ripping tides of sin. We peer out into the ocean, which is the world. Imagine that the ocean is the world. And we see people, they're splashing and they're having a good time. And naturally we aim to join them. Who doesn't aim to join them? When you go out into the ocean, you go up to your waist, you feel good. It's like, this is great. Look, ah, everybody's laughing, screaming, having a great time. They're on boogie boards. The world is the ocean. I was standing in the very, very small water with, with Ziva, Liel, and, and, and Eliana. And here comes a wave. Small, very, very small, lower than my knees. Just takes Lieli. Boom, there she goes. And if I didn't scoop her up, guess what? She'd have been out there in the ocean. Here we are, aiming to join everybody that's out there splashing around. But when we're out there, we're unprepared for the cross currents of sin that move us quickly from our destination to an island exiled from the presence of God. We're unprepared in the ocean. We're out to our waist all of a sudden. You ever have the riptides come? And who's been to the ocean? Tell me, who's been there? I mean, does this analogy work for you? Have you even been to the ocean? Okay, so you're out in the ocean. You're up to your waist. The waves are, the waves are higher than your head when you're in the ocean when you're at your waist. Okay? All of a sudden, a rip current comes. You feel the rip current crossing by you, and it's pulling you, and you're fighting it. You ever do it? And we laugh. Ha, ah, this is funny. It's not funny. It's dangerous. It's a scary event. We're fighting that rip current. That's sin in life. We're in, the, we're in this ocean called life, and here comes sin, which is a rip current, and we're fighting against it, and we're laughing. While we're doing it, it's funny. It's an enjoyable time. It's not a hard thing yet. So here we are. But if that rip current really gets a hold of you, it sweeps out your feet, it could take you out to what we call a sandbar. Anybody ever been stuck on a sandbar? That means that the ocean gets really, really deep, and then it gets not so deep again. And you could be way, way out there, standing on a sandbar, and everybody else is out there, and you, have to, you, have to, you either have to swim back Good luck, or someone has to come out and get you. So here, we're exiled on an island from the presence of God as the rip turns of sin. We're in Galut. Remember, the presence of God is on the beach. And here we are in the ocean, exiled from the presence of God. 
The world is a dangerous place, like the ocean. It can be harmless, and it can be fun if you're only up to your waist. But once you get to a place when you can no longer stand, you're subject to the currents that rip and roar beneath you. The statutes and the commandments of God are our life vest in this world that is an ocean. The statutes and commands are the life vest that we wear that protect us. They keep us floating when the tides rise to, too high around us. Our mission is to be that spark that ignites the passion for God's commands in others that we frantically, that are frantically swimming against the tides. Sorry, there's bugs over here. I'd rather do that than do like this. A few weeks ago, we read about Moshe, we read about his prophecies, that the people of Israel will fail in future generations to keep the covenants and the statutes that God placed before them at Horeb. How on earth, we, we, read, we read about these covenants that, that Moshe has, and Moshe looks at them and says, right now you're in, you're in covenant with God, right now you're following his commands, right now we're doing what we can, we're living right. But he prophesies to the children of Israel that you will not in the future, in future generations. I mean, what a depressing event. You're going to fail God. You're going to fail His commands. The word states, out of the iron furnace of Egypt, that He pulled them out of the iron furnace of Egypt and placed them into the safety of, this, of His country, bringing them into Geulah from Galut, into redemption from exile. But here, Moses reveals yet again the nature of man explaining that they will enter into Galut once again and that there they will seek God now you're in this redemption but you will once again be in exile I mean what a disaster and it's sad because it's not just them it's their children that are in exile it's them they're gone they're dead it's their children that he's talking about your children will fail God's command You know, I've heard people say it many times. Uh, you'll have to deal with that, not me. I'll be long gone before that happens, right? We have issues like the, uh, what is that, the greenhouse effect. You know, the, uh, what are those gases called? Greenhouse gases or something, you know, that all of a sudden there's, what is that called, that event that, uh, huh? Yeah, global warming. There it is. I actually am kind of smart, but not a, I guess I forgot. So global warming, you know, people say, well, I don't have to worry about that. You don't worry about it. You know, your children are going to have to worry about that. That's kind of what this is. They'll be like, well, at least we're following commands, our children. No, these are your children, your offspring. They're going to fail God. That has to be a wrenching, tearing away of your heart and your spirit. That has to feel absolutely terrible. But what does this reveal? That they're going to go to Galut from Geulah. What does it reveal? It reveals that God's relationship with man is truly developed in a place of challenge and tribulation. Do you understand that your true relationship with God, the depth at which and the intensity at which you know God, is developed out of tribulation? It's developed out of a period of time that's hard. Israel, the name Israel, one who wrestles with God, one who contends with God. Israel, he goes from Jacob, someone who's the supplanter. Remember the name Yaakov means to supplant. He's the supplanter. Yaakov becomes the contender of God, the one who fights, the one who wrestles. And what? guess what? We're the sons of Jacob. So we wrestle with God. That means we're fighters. We're going to wrestle with God. We're the sons of Jacob. You are the product of Jacob. Each and every one of you. I don't care if you think you're a Gentile or you came out of the church or what. You're the product of Jacob. You're the product of Yaakov because without Yaakov, you wouldn't have the children of Israel. Without the children of Israel, you wouldn't have the King David. Without King David, you wouldn't have the Messiah. Because God ordained it from the beginning with Abraham. You're the result of Yaakov. 
The belief in Yeshua is the result of these men fighting to believe, fighting to follow the one true God, the invisible God, the most high God, the one who is great above all, the one who is worthy above all, the most sovereign king, the king of kings and lord of lords, the God of all gods. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 it says, When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image. Verse 25 through 35, these 10 verses. I've got to wrap up shortly, but, so that's why I'm not going to get into it. Everything I'm saying, by the way, comes from stories in the Bible. Okay? I might not be reading the text. People say that to me all the time. Well, you, where, why don't you read the text? I am reading the text. I'm just, I'm, compa I'm you know, talking about it. So we talked about the children's children. Here, chapter 4, verse 25. When thou shalt beget children and children's children, then you will, and you've remained long in the land, in the promised land, you will forget God. This is that prophecy. And here Moshe says, I call on heaven and earth to witness against you this day. To witness against you. They haven't even done it. It's not even them. But Moshe is saying, I call upon heaven and earth. Remember, what happens in heaven happens on earth. There's, they're together. And there's this firmament that exists between them. And we have to live in that firmament. We have to live in that place with God. Our spirit has to reach them. I call on heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. What a killjoy. They're about to go over to the land of promise and he literally tells them, you're going to lose it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but your children's children are going to lose it. So don't get so comfortable there. Don't get so comfortable in Geula. Don't get so comfortable in your redemption, which you think is before you. You will be in Galut, and we traverse, and we continually vacillate between Galut and Geula, and it is our nature. It is the nature of man to continually move in and out of the presence of God, to continually move from the commands to our own ways, continually moving and fighting. How long does it take? How long does it take for man to come to a place of yachidah, of singularity with God, a place of oneness with God, so we can become a chadusar, one flesh, one spirit, one mind, one truth with God? You have to have wisdom and humility, understanding and humility. The understanding that Shlomo had was, was, was lost during his 20s and 30s. And maybe into his 40s, I don't know, but the guy died at 52, so, you know, Ecclesiastes was written at some point in his life. He might have had some gray hair. I mean, I'm only 38 years old, and I'm getting gray. You don't see it, because I keep my hair short. You got, you got these problems that these people are dealing with, the children of Israel deal with. We deal with the same ones. They just might be different. I mean, we're not in a desert place. We're not asking for man to fall down from heaven to feed ourselves and feed our children. We haven't had one pair of shoes for the entire journey, okay? We, we change our shoes about every four to six months if you want to keep good feet. You know, we're in a different state, but the reality is that we have to do what? Verse 29. If from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If you seek him with all your heart, with all your soul, Bechol Lavavka, Ufkol Nafshecha. We say that every week. Right? Bechol Lavavka, Ufkol Nafshecha, Ufkol Modecha, with all our heart, soul, and mind. What? These commands which I give you this day should be on your heart, on your doorposts. Sit in your house, walk by the way, rise up, lie down. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. I brought it up, right? We talked about what that means. If, he, if with all of our heart, our soul, we follow the commands and we seek Him, and we will find Him, behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
Seek me and you will find me, the word says. We seek him with all our heart, soul, and mind. When thou art in tribulation, the Bible says, when you are in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord your God is merciful God. He will not forsake you, neither destroy you, neither forget you. The covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. Listen, it's the beauty of God, unbelievable grace that you just read. I don't understand how the church doesn't see the grace of God in the, in the scriptures. I just read so much grace that you can't even describe. These people are going to turn. Leave Galut to Geola. There's so much grace in the Torah. This is the Torah. This is Tavarim. This is not the Brit Chadashah. This is not the book of Yochanan. This is not John. This is Deuteronomy. And this is Moshe. And Moshe is saying that God is gracious to forgive you of your sins. Did you just hear? He said it. I, he will forgive you. If what? You seek me with all your heart, soul, and mind. If what? You're obedient to my commandments. It's difficult to understand why we have to suffer to truly come to God. But it's also important to understand that the soul, nafesh of man, is not completely discovered until it is faced with challenges. Your nefesh, your soul, your, your inner being is not completely discovered until you have struggles. Until you go through tribulation, that which is inside of you is not completely developed. So we have to be strugglers. I'm a struggler. I struggle. You have to be a struggler. People might think, you know, oh, he's just, oh, he's struggling. Oh, man. Like, that's a terrible thing. That's a blessed thing. Blessed are you if you struggle. Good for you, you're struggling. What does that mean? Because you will find that which you seek. You will find that who is within you. You will find your strength. Modek. With all your strength, what does that mean? With all my passion, I seek the commands of God with everything that I am inside. That is the power of the Holy Spirit which is inside of you residing. It should be fighting and struggling to bring life to you so that the spark of the Mashiach which comes out of you pours out onto others. You are a filled vessel and you pour out onto others and you bring them new life. New wine. God allows His people to be vetted through circumstances that bring them to a state a failure and force them to either turn to him or further away from him. Throughout history, oppressive circumstances have stimulated humanity's most profound and innovative creations, while conditions of unmitigated freedom seemingly yield less imaginative results. Unmitigated freedom, you will you don't have good results. Somebody that has it all, that lives well, that does this and that, and doesn't experience hardship, they don't get to develop well. Sometimes it's good. It's like we want to do well for our kids. You know, we want to, we want to give them everything. We want, to, we want to care for them. We want to protect them. We want to ensure that they're never, ever harmed. And we want to give them a life that, you know, they, they've never... They, 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 that they'll never have to suffer. We want to do that. Guess what? That's good for them. The result without, of not suffering is going to be less impactful in the world than a little bit of suffering. They're going to develop and grow. Man, all those generations, the, the, the immigrants that came here, those immigrants are fight. They were fighters. Man did they fight and man did they build. They built. Innovation is built on the back of, of, the, of the immigrants that came here. Our parents, grandparents, great grandparents. Now you got a bunch of kids running around without their minds. They don't know how to live. They don't know what to do. They're, they're lost. Why? 
they haven't struggled much. Because they let their parents and their grandparents do it for them. You got these companies that are built that the kids just get right into and they start building it. It's the saddest thing ever because what happens is a lot of time those kids, they destroy those, those companies. They destroy them. You destroy what your family built. You didn't care. You didn't care because you had no care. Think about the Age of Enlightenment. It was forged from the, the annals of medieval routines of war and hard work. In the Middle Ages, people were focused primarily on, on the agrarian life and surviving another year without being destroyed in battle. During the Renaissance, new paths were formed throughout art and the printing press that encouraged people to challenge rather than riding this current of status quo. Humankind, when they're challenged and faced with imminent changes or conflict, always achieves new ways to find Geula, redemption. When you're lost, you do everything you can to get found. More importantly, you spend time praying and seeking God to point you to the to point that you must necessarily find him because when we ask or seek, he is obliged to answer. He told us. The most important truth to know is that we must never stop praying, never stop asking God to supply us, never yield to banishment from his presence, but fight for his attention and mercy. Moshe pleaded with God, as we talked about a few parashas ago. He pleaded with God. And remember I told you, he says, Lo, let it be. Enough is enough, God said to Moshe. Must speak. No more from you. Moshe kept pleading, kept pleading, kept pleading. The Talmud cites an interesting rule of etiquette. Remember, the Talmud is not anything but a historical document. Okay? It's not the word of God. It's not words of God. It's nothing. It's just a document, a historical document that, that spans out words of wisdom and insight. No different from what I'm doing up here. But it cites an interesting rule of etiquette governing guest-host relations. And this is what's interesting. Whatever the host instructs, you must do, except when he says, get out of my house. Isn't that funny? Talmud says that when you go to someone's house and someone tells you, get out of my house, you're going to have to get out of his house. Well, they'll probably call the cops. But the rabbis teach that this applies to our relationship with God. And as a guest in God's world, we must obey all that he instructs us to do except when he tells us to get out. When he banishes us from his presence, we're not to obey, but to persist in our efforts to come close to him. So even as we submit to its decrees, we do not reconcile ourselves with the phenomenon of galut. We do not accept exile. No, I will not leave you. Imagine, you know, you get in a fight with your wife and she says, get out. No, I'm not getting out. Get out, I don't want to talk to you right now. Well, you're going to have to talk to me. You don't have a choice. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm right here, and we're going to hash this out. No, get out. No, I'm not getting out. And you keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Sooner or later, my wife and I have done that before, and guess what? Sooner or later, it turns into a laugh. Sooner or later, it becomes funny. She's so serious and get out, get out. I'm like, I'm not getting out. I'm standing right here. We're going to have its talk. And sooner or later, she starts laughing because I'm persistent about it, and it becomes funny, and then we can talk normal. But that's the concept. No, we can't let God banish us. We can't do that. When he commands us, when, when, when God commands us, do this or do, do not do this, we obey. Yet we refuse to accept that galut, the exile from him. We refuse to accept the closing of venues in our relationship with God. And it is from this in, incessant struggle, from this unremitting tension between our acceptance of the, of the curbs of galut and our striving to break free of them, that our most creative achievements in our relationship with God arise. Complete geula is found when we can, with humbleness, realize we are undeserving of the mercies of God. We're 
undeserving of God's mercy. And interestingly, I see a trend throughout Scripture that reveals that the state of exile is quite possibly the only true impetus that can prompt this feeling of humility required for humankind to experience God on the deepest level. I have my own personal galut. And I heard God say to me, Ayeka. Ayeka is what God said to Adam in the garden. Anybody know what God said to Adam in the garden? Where are you? Ayeka doesn't mean where are you physically. Ayeka means where are you? When God said to Adam, Ayeka, he said, where are you? What happened? And so God says to me, I'm just kind of, you know, going to hit me, Ayeka, I have to, to respond. Where are you? We cannot be in galut in our minds and in our hearts. We cannot be in motion. We cannot just let things be. We have to be strugglers at all times. And so I have to fight back with, with God. I'm right here. And I will do what I need to to get there. What have I done that you, Lord, are saying, Ayaka, seeking so that I can knock on the door and find him. Seeking him is the most important thing. Humility is the key that unlocks the favor and mercy of God. To have spiritual arrogance drives you further into exile away from the presence of as a result of your pride. Moving from galut to Gaelah or total redemption is based on the condition of the heart. It is not likely that the condition of man's heart is perfect from the beginning. The experience must from the heart experience must from the heart and prepare it <coughs> must form the heart and prepare it to be humble and submissive otherwise it is prideful and combative the proverb states Mishle states the highway of the upright is to depart from evil he, he that keepeth his way preserveth his soul pride goeth before destruction a haughty spirit before a fall better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud remember in the beginning we talked about all these different things Right about the, the materialism in the life and the pictures fading on the walls and all of these things. This is the proud. We fight. We become pride. We look in the mirror. We try to be. Well, what does it mean to be humble? Better to be with a humble spirit and with the lowly than with the proud. That doesn't mean that you can't walk among the proud with a humble spirit. You just have to know what it takes to have that humble spirit. We must get to a state where we are continually seeking and performing a mission for his kingdom. Prayer is the must in your life. The Jewish tradition is to pray three times a day. Three times a day you should say the Shema, you should say, uh, no, the, most of the prayers are fixed that are said for, the, for those three times a day. Most of those prayers are fixed. Do you need a fixed prayer? Every day you should at least say the Shema and you should at least say what we call the Ve'ah Hafta. Remind yourself every day. And I do it and I, I've been saying every day instead of saying you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I say and I will love you God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. And the words which you command me today I will keep in my heart. I will inscribe them on the doorpost of my house. I will inscribe them when I sit in the house, when I walk by the way. Light up. Pray it. It changes your life. It changes the way you think. It changes your entire being. If you focus on it. 
People ask me about my beard. You know why I have a beard? It's not because it's style. It's not because everyone is growing beards these days. Because it's the period of time from, from Tisha B'Av to Rosh Hashanah, God said to me, don't shave. When he says to me, Ayeka. And I didn't understand it. And, and maybe it's a tradition and maybe it's this and that. But guess what? Every single day of my life, I feel it growing. Every moment of the day, I feel my beard growing. Every moment of the day, I feel it right now. There's a sensation on my face. You know what it does? It reminds me every single moment to stay in the presence of God. Because I made the commitment. I made the personal commitment. And I'm reminded to stay in the presence of God. I feel it. And if I start to, to be a, a, a dummy and get engaged into a conversation with somebody, I feel my face and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 i got to change the, 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 the world that I'm in, right? Because we're in the world, we're in this ocean up to our waists. It's a reminder The problem today is that people are not praying. They're not in a concert with a divine spark that brings life and encouragement. And thus they're simply living their lives without order, without a mission. We're reading this week about the children of Israel. There was a great sage that said with deep despair, have you ever calculated how many precious youth hours are going to waste every single day? The use of every such hour could work wonders. Instead of giving orders, the leaders make speeches and the young people go to cafes and waste their precious irretrievable time. Do you remember them during the Sinai campaign? How they rose like one man because there was a commander whose orders were such as they had been waiting for, even if they did not know it beforehand. Just give them an order as was done during the Sinai campaign. Never mind the particulars. All that matters is that it should ignite some spark as it did then, and you will see how all the latent forces will rise up again. This is a quote from what I was reading. People were walking, we're all wasting and walking our, our, our time, walking it out. It's precious, it's valuable. Our orders have been given, our purpose is clear. We're to make disciples of men and women by igniting the divine spark that revive, resides latent in most every human being and bring them into the knowledge of the truth and understanding. We're trying to make a way along the same path as everyone else, carve a new path and help people find their way to Geula from Galut. Amen. In closing, I'll just read Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Yeshua had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Yeshua came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Ruach HaKodesh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am always with you, even until the end of the world. Amen. It is our duty to praise the Master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation, for he made us unlike the nation of the lands. He's not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs, our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the King of Kings. The Holy One, blessed is He. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. The seat of His glory is in the heavens above, and in the presence of His power is in the most exalted heights. He's our God, there is none other. True is our King. There's nothing beside Him as it is written in His Torah. You shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord He is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is none other. Amen.